Hey, everybody, welcome. Welcome to the next in our series of webinars dealing with best practices for Prisma Access deployments. We're going to be concentrating on the mobile user solution today. Uh, we're going to cover lots of different aspects of it. Uh, authentication options and some best practices there. Uh, a quick run through the configuration steps. We're going to talk about all the com different components, the portals, the mobile user security processing nodes, the client software. We'll even go through some troubleshooting and best practices there. And one of the features we're going to be highlighting is going to be uh, the use of HIP or host inspection profiles, how we set those up and how we can use those, use those to do things like um, check non-corporate devices, for instance, bringing your own devices if you're going to allow users to connect into the network, into Prisma Access using, say, their you know tablet or their phone, and it's not controlled corporately, we can check different settings and make sure that, that, that they're compliant. Now that they do have antivirus, that they have done an antivirus scan, you know, they're not going to infect you with malware, that sort of thing, before we let them into, uh, into the environment. And we'll see how we can do that. So we'll begin with what you need to have beforehand. You got to have the proper licensing, this first thing. There are a couple of different licenses and licensing levels that support mobile users. There are some that don't. Our enterprise licensing does, as well as our uh, ZTNA licensing, our uh, Zero Trust Network Architecture, are designed to include the mobile user solution. Some of the other ones don't, so you need to make sure you have the right one. Uh, you got to have Cortex Data Lake instance for logging. If you already have any components set up for Prism Access already, you've got that. You might very well need a corporate access node and a service connection to, to reach that. When would you need this? Well, if you have users that need to all use some sort of a service, that you're hosting at a data center, whether it's physical data center down on the ground or some sort of authentication service or DNS service or something that's, that's in the public cloud, you know, that you're hosting in AWS or you're hosting in Google Cloud or, or Azure or whatever. You know, if you have a Azure-based Active Directory that you're using or some sort of a... Uh, multi-factor authentication that might be cloud-based or in a data center sitting on a server, or maybe you have an internal DNS server sitting in a data center. If your users need to reach that, while they're using Prisma Access, we need to have a CAN, a corporate access node, uh, with a service connection so that users can securely reach whatever service that might be. Typically, authentication and DNS are the two biggies. Your users are going to have to authenticate. Uh, Global Protect, mobile user solution with Prism Access or even on premise or any combination thereof makes a really good self-contained um, self, uh, user ID solution for you. In fact, it's the most accurate one. When a user connects to Global Protect, we authenticate them so we know who they are. We hand them out an IP address. So we know what IP address they're using. So you see, we've got that user to IP mapping already without having to set up anything else. 
So authentication is a big part of that. And therefore, we support just about any authentication method out there. Anything from a local user list, a local user database, uh, Radius, LDAP, DACX, uh, certificate-based authentication with client certificates, multi-factor, SAML, Kerberos, uh, with multi-factor with Okta and Ping and Google and all kinds of uh, other ones. So whatever needs you have, I'm sure we're gonna be able to support it. When you're deploying Prism Access for mobile users, Global Protect in the cloud, you need to, uh, or not you need to, you should, as a good troubleshooting step, create a user in the local user database. Now you may be using Radius Authentication or LDAP or whatever for your normal users, but as a best practice troubleshooting step, let's do that. Create an account. This can be used to test, to make sure that all the components of Prism Access that you need for your mobile user solution are up and working and helps eliminate any external issues like maybe a problem with your LDAP server or problem with the uh, SAML setup or a problem with uh, multi-factor authentication or something like that. Keep it simple first, then we can add the authentication uh, once we know that all the nodes are working. While we're setting everything up, we will go ahead and set up our authentication needs. Uh, and then we'll just switch between different authentication methods to test things. So we do need a server profile if we're gonna do any sort of remote authentication. You know, we're gonna do radius authentication. I need to know about my radius server. LDAP, whatever I'm doing, there's gonna be different server profiles and different server types that you're going to need. And then there's, we support, as I said, just about everything you can think about there. That server profile becomes part of an authentication profile. And the authentication profile uh, is added to your global protect setup to say, you need to authenticate with this method or that method or this other method. So. Conceivably, you could have different user bases authenticating differently. So we need different authentication profiles and different server profiles. Or you can even have uh, multiple factors or multiple uh, options. I shouldn't say multiple factors. We do support multi-factor, but multiple options, uh, multiple steps for authentication. You, you know, you can say, well, try the radius server. If that doesn't work, then let's go use local user database. That would be an authentication sequence, which would just be a collection of authentication profiles. That's sort of the prerequisite stuff. Now, deploying the mobile user solution, if you've done it with Global Protect on on-premise firewalls, it's actually much simpler through Prism Access. Good news. You'll, um, you'll really appreciate it. You go through the normal uh, uh, cloud services configuration. You'll get your overlay here, the gray overlay. That'll tell you the steps to create things. Basically three steps here, three major steps. You create your template stack, which is automated. Uh, we create a device group. You stick it in the hierarchy wherever you need it to be. Any zones you're gonna be using for global protect uh, for the mobile user solution. And then you start setting up your portal. Set up the portal. You're going to uh, get a menu. It's gonna have different tabs across the top general locations, IP pools, network services, 
uh, manual gateway locations. We'll talk about that too. You're gonna need a host name for, for the portal. Customers may have their own domains. They can tell you what it's gonna be, which means you can use their domain. They don't have to though, we have our own. And the default domain is ours, uh, uh, globalprotectcloudservices.com, or I'm sorry, gpcloudservice.com. Let me be very precise about that. People like to put an S at the end of that. It's not gpcloudservices, it's gpcloudservice.com. Um, you'll stick your authentication profiles that we created in there. Uh, certificate based, uh, we can do authentication overrides or a global authentication profile that we'll use everywhere. You choose your locations. There, uh, as you know, are different regions within Prisma Access, roughly broken down to the different continents. You got North America, South America, you got Asia, Europe, there's Middle East. Uh, we have um, Asia, we have uh, Australia, New Zealand. And you'll want to choose what region you're gonna be in and then locations within that region. You're gonna wanna choose more than one location. And you're gonna want the locations to be physically near where your users are. So if I got users in Silicon Valley and users in New York, well, I'd wanna pick a couple of locations close to them. You use the map, or if you would prefer to have a list, a textual list, you can use that too. There's just a little uh, switch button to go in between. You're not charged by the number of locations. So pick them close to where your users are so they get great performance and a great user experience. Uh, the licensing for the mobile user solution is based on the unique number of mobile users, not devices to users. So, you know, if I got my phone and my laptop and my workstation and I got my tablet and I got my personal laptop, my corporate laptop, you know, I can, that's a bunch of different devices, but it, we look at the authentication, we look who the user is and you're charged by unique users, not individual devices. You're also not charged by locations. So choose all the ones you need. Uh, no need to shortchange yourself here. As I mentioned, one of the great things about Global Protect or the mobile user solution with Prism Access is that we authenticate the user so we know who they are. We hand out an IP address so we know what their IP is. So we have that user to IP mapping, part of, app of user ID self-contained. So we need an IP pool. We need the no, we need a, a pool of addresses that we're going to hand out users, uh, hand out to users as they um, as they connect. You need to make sure your IP pool is a sufficient size. Uh, you also need to make sure that you're not using these same IP addresses elsewhere in your networks. You know, you don't want IP conflicts, overlapping IPs. Uh, the minimum size is a slash twenty three. Uh, which is basically two class C networks. So slash 23. How many do you need? Well, a rule of thumb is to take the number of users that you're gonna have in your deployment and multiply that by at least five. Because remember, I could connect with my 
workstation, my laptop, my personal tablet, my phone. Well, there's four IP addresses I need just for me right there. So they're non-routable IP addresses, they're free. It's not like you're charged money for them. So it'd be better to have too many than not enough. You might even go 10 IPs per user. Don't, it's much easier to overshoot the number you're gonna need than undershoot the number you're gonna need. It's a little bit harder to sort it out after the fact. You have the ability to set up a single IP pool that everybody's gonna use worldwide, or you can break them down basically in the hemispheres, uh, North and South America, the Maya, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and uh, Asia. And you have separate IPs per um, hemisphere if you want to, but um, maybe you need some sort of schema where you're trying to avoid overlapping IPs and you got IPs that you know you're not using in North America as internal IP addresses, but you might be using them somewhere else. So these are safe to use in North and South America. So I'll use these IP addresses here, but I don't want to use them worldwide because I could get conflicts. So you have the ability to regionalize them or a combination thereof. Uh, network services. Uh, DNS is a big player here. If you have resources that you need to be able to uh, resolve to internal IP addresses when people are inside Prism Access, but would normally resolve to public IP addresses if they weren't, then you can point people at internal DNS servers or specific lists of domains. And we do wildcards. So we have, you know, like anything, you know, asterisk.mycompany.com. Means anything, any request for whatever.mycompany.com, I'm going to send to my internal DNS servers. Then I can um, also say, well, for public domains, use the cloud default, the cloud default would be a public DNS server, uh, or um, uh, perhaps you send everything to an internal DNS server and it splits off uh, public and private stuff. The components, if you're not familiar with the solution, there's three pieces here. And we're gonna talk about them, talk about the setup and talk about troubleshooting. Oh, first about the three pieces. Three pieces are the portal, the mobile user SPNs. So this would be equivalent to a global protect gateway with an on-premise firewall. And the software, the client. We have Global Protect Client software, it's free. It's available for Windows and Macs. Uh, the Windows and Macs software can be hosted in the portal. So a user could simply browse, open a browser, browse to that portal host name that you chose, and they'll get a page to download the Global Protect Client. More often, uh, this will be, instead of being hosted on the Global Protect portal, the customers will have it as part of their corporate image, preloaded. Uh, or for users that have their own devices, you know, bring your own device, uh, non-corporate devices. Uh, we have iOS, and Android and Chromebook uh, available at the App Store and Google Play for free. Uh, there, there's no charge for the client, no matter what version you're using. The Windows ones and the uh, Mac ones, 
they're free. You download the software from our sports site and deploy it however you see fit. For Linux, we do have a Linux global tech client also. It's CLI based. Uh, it's designed for, well, it could be any Linux device. Uh, like a, you could be running a Linux operating system on your laptop or something, but more likely it's gonna be to protect some sort of a server, like a Linux server that you may have deployed in the public cloud. That would be a good use case for the Linux app for global tech. That way you can do threat protections and all those sort of things that you're used to doing with an on-premise firewall you can do through global protect, I mean, through Prism access. The portal acts as a sort of the air traffic controller, the traffic cop. Uh, it is the primary or the first connection that a, that a user's device will make when they're entering Prisma Access. The portal is going to have uh, what we call a client configuration that's going to have a bunch of rules about where users can connect gateways or mobile user SPNs they can use, uh, how they connect. Are they able to disconnect or not? Uh, all kinds of different settings. Uh, those host suspension profiles uh, that we wanna use to uh, double check and make sure that non-corporate devices, personal devices are, are compliant, set those up here. So the idea is the client software on the device connects to the Prisma Access Portal. Portal says, hey, these are the different places you can connect. And by default, the user is gonna to connect to the closest mobile user SPN or, or Global Protect Gateway that's closest to them. Uh, you could in the portal say, you know what? No, you always need to connect to uh, location number one first. If location number one is not available, your backup is location number two, even though it's halfway around the world. Uh, but by default, users would connect to the closest one. But in the portal, you set up the rules to tell the Global Protect client what it can and can't do. Then the client disconnects and connects to that gateway, that mobile user SPN, the mobile user security processing node. Cool thing about the mobile user processing nodes, as I said, you want them as close as you can to your users but you may have a really large concentration of users in one spot and a smaller concentration of users in another spot. You know, maybe my, half of my mobile users are in Silicon Valley. 10% uh, are in New York. 20% uh, are in the central United States. 10% are in Singapore. Uh, the idea is you don't need to spin up a bunch of gateways near Silicon Valley to, to, to support all these people. We take care of that behind the scenes for you. We do what we call auto scale. So even though you are putting a, you're choosing a location, you're saying, yeah, I need a location, you know, here in Silicon Valley. Uh, you don't have to specify how many of these iterations of these mobile user SPNs that you need. We're going to auto scale and the more users that connect, the more nodes that we spring up. Uh, 
then conversely, shrink. You know, maybe you're having a big convention and you have a large concentration of users in one spot that's abnormal, or you're going to auto scale to meet your needs. And when everybody goes back home, everything will calm down back to normal. So we'll auto scale up and down. Nothing you have to configure to make that happen. Next thing we have to do is go into our templates under the network tabs. And there's going to be a template created for the Global Protect Portal and the gateway settings. Normally, you configure all this stuff manually. If you were doing this on an on-premise firewall, about 80% of it is automatically done for you here. So it's a very easy exercise. We'll start with the portal. Um, you can have portal login pages. So if somebody uh, connects to the portal. Uh, we can do transparent background authentication. Or we're gonna have a login page saying, hey, stick your username up here. Put your password here. You have a welcome page. It says, welcome to mycompany.com. Uh, little helper pages or whatever. Uh, or not. Under the authentication tab, that authentication profile we created gets added. Or multiple ones. We can have more than one, and then we can say who uses which one. Under the agent tab, uh, there's a few things. Uh, there are the rules that the portal is going to hand out those client configurations. Uh, those include things like connection methods. We have a few different connection methods we're going to talk about. Um, we can do the uh, the configuration refresh interval. In other words, we say, hey, you know, check into the portal every 24 hours, make sure none of your rules have changed. You know, we, we haven't changed anything on here. Uh, do we want to allow users to disconnect manually or not? We can say yes or no. Um, do you want to make sure that users, um, if they do disconnect, they have to give us a reason? Yes or no. Uh, do you want to let people uninstall the Global Protect app in Windows? Uh, so you can kind of read, the, read these different options here. These are settings that are going to be sent to a user as they connect to the portal. So that's that client config, or at least part of that client config we were just talking about. One of the things people ask about is the connection methods a lot. So there are pre-configured settings here, but of course you have the ability just to change them. But these are sort of the most common, uh, the, all the settings, but the most common responses to those settings. In other words, what, what, what is most popular. Uh, there is, there are three connection methods. There's on-demand. And on-demand means that if a user needs to connect to Prism Access, you know, use Global Protect, they turn it on themselves and connect. And when they're done, they disconnect. Otherwise, they're not using Global Protect, their mobile user solution for Prism Access. Well, in most cases, probably want to make sure that your users are all protected. So uh, there are a couple of other options. There's user logon, which means whenever I log on to my device, let's say I open my laptop and log in, 
it's going to automatically launch global tech and uh, get me connected. So anytime my device is in use, it's connected. That would mean if I had two accounts, you know, uh, have my account and I had my son had an account on my laptop, I could have me use Global Protect, but not that. Um, that may not be secure enough for you. Pre-log on or sort of always log on is the most popular one. And that means whenever the device is connected to the network or you know, connected that has internet access, even if nobody's logged on to it, it's connected to global, uh, global protect. Uh, this requires that we have a device certificate and basically identifies the device and says, yeah, this device should be connected. Now then when you log in and authenticate, well, it starts identifying as you. This means that whoever's logged on, nobody's logged on. If this device, say, gets, uh, uh, anytime it's in use, it's using Global Protect. A lot of customers that use a mobile device solution, uh, uh, an MDM vendor, like this option. Let's say you got a corporate phone or corporate laptop or something like that. A user leaves it on the plane, gets their pocket picked and somebody steals their phone or whatever. Uh, it can be mobily wiped, you know, if, the, if that's what you're doing with your MDM solution, uh, because the device is connected. You have access to it. So that pre-log on is a pretty, uh, pretty popular option. Uh, user log on and pre-log on are, are the two more popular ones. Uh, the one that's the default is user log on. Then you can choose, do you wanna allow people to log off? Yes or no? You may say no, you know what? If you're using, if you're, if you're online, you're using Prisma Access. I don't want you to be able to disable it. A lot of customers like that. Um, also, there's data collection, HIP, host inspection profiles. We can collect a lot of data about the device that's connected. Then we can write rules to enforce compliance of these different settings. We can say, you know what? If somebody's going to connect, I want to make sure they got antivirus enabled. I want to make sure that they've done an antivirus scan sometime in the last seven days or 30 days or whatever. I want to make sure that they are using disk encryption. There's lots of different variables. We'll take a look at them. Uh, but you um, want to make sure that if you want to make these rules, you need to collect the HIP data. And then we can talk, uh, and in a minute, we'll talk about what it is that you can collect. What data are you collecting? Um, that's it for the portal. The gateway setup is much simpler. Uh, basically, nothing under the general tab. Uh, authentication profile under the authentication tab. Probably the same one you're using on the portal. Uh, they can be inherited from your uh, global setup, or it could be different. Under the agent tab, about the only thing here is the idea of uh, using an IPsec tunnel for mobile users to connect or use an SSL. IPsec is enabled by default. If you disable it, and use SSL, an SSL session. Um, it's also support for extended authentication, XAuth support. Uh, so maybe, um, for instance, an iPhone has an IPsec client built into, a VPN client built into it. Uh, you may 
want to use that instead of the global protect client. Uh, that would mean that a user would have to manually log in. Uh, they basically wouldn't go to the portal. They go straight to a gateway. They need to know how to get there. And then they would have some sort of a, a generic username password to get in. And then after that, they'd authenticate individually to themselves. So that's a possibility also. Uh, as we go across the top, not a whole lot else there. Um, one of the things is, um, uh, is we do and can support split tunneling where a we may want to direct some traffic from a mobile device or remote user, a mobile user uh, through Global Protect and other stuff just locally. You know, someone's sitting at home and they're reaching, you know, their work applications. Yeah, let's use Global Protect if they're connected to Global Protect and they're streaming Netflix. Well, let's not chew up our bandwidth for it. Let's let them chew up their own at home. Uh, we can do that. Uh, so we treat video traffic different. We can do split tunneling, uh, which basically says, well, if you're using this application, use your local gateway or use your global protect connection. With global protect on uh, devices that are deployed on premise, that's a consideration for bandwidth consumption. With Prism Access mobile user solution, do you really care? Because you're not paying for bandwidth. We're gonna support however much bandwidth you need. So what may be a limitation or a consideration with on-premise ones may not be. Oops, went the wrong way. Um, so basically, once you got those set, what were we talking about here? Maybe 12, 15 steps all together versus maybe a hundred steps to do this manually. I mean, on an on-premise firewall, you're ready to commit. You'll commit, commit your mobile user stuff. Uh, if you set up multiple components at the same time, it's a good idea to do the commit separately. So even if I'm doing remote networks and service setups and mobile users all at once, I would do the commits separately. That way, hey, I know this worked. If I'm having a problem and something failed, you know, I know it wasn't my mobile user. I know that that went perfectly. Uh, you know, then if I do my remote networks, that's where I have a uh, an error. Well, I know that's where I need to be troubleshooting not my entire configuration, just that one piece. There's a monitor tab, the cloud services status, which is right on top of the configuration where we've been. And um, has a nice little uh, monitor tab. This is great for determining how things are working. So it'll show you, you choose your mobile users in this case, and it'll show you the different locations where your gateways, where your mobile user SPNs are being spun up. And you'll be able to see their status. So green light, red light, yellow light. Uh, green is good. Green means everything's okay. You can click on the little icons and you can get details. But well, the red, I'll tell you what the problem is. One thing this, this doesn't show you is your portal. And the gateways seem to spin up faster than the portal. Portal takes a little bit more. Uh, I think it's because basically spinning up the nodes and figuring out how many nodes you need and and all this sort of stuff. So I think there's a little more computation going on. 
but it takes them a little bit longer. So once you see green lights and everything looks pretty, probably your portal's not up, probably won't be up for another five or 10 minutes. This is where the use of your local user test account can really help you out. So I can browse to the portal host name, the URL. I'm not doing it with my Global Protect client. I'm just using it with a browser just to see if it's awake, see if it's up. I'll either get no response whatsoever, which means eh, it's going to be longer than a couple of minutes. Or I'll connect with my browser. I'll get this error, just as error. Um, this tells me my portal's not quite up yet, but it's almost there. If I get no response, it means it's going to be a little while. Uh, probably take, at this point, if you get the error message, probably think in another five to maybe even 15 minutes. Uh, but everything's progressing great. So everything should be fine. You, you know, at least at this point, go, okay, I'm just impatient. Nothing's broken. Uh, then once you can browse to the portal with a browser, now you can try to connect with the client. Uh, now you can try that local user, make sure you can connect, make sure you get through, you can get out to the internet. If you can't get out with that local user account, well, you can start troubleshooting your basic deployment, but you know that it's not an authentic authentication issue. If this all works, now you can add your authentication profiles for remote authentication, make sure that works. So now, you know, you've broken your troubleshooting in, in, into two different sections. So you're not having to chase around a hundred different things, just a couple of different things. Also, under the status, uh, next, there's a few tabs. There was the uh, monitor tab we saw. There's also a status tab. And again, green, yellow, red lights. Green is good, red is dead. Uh, if you click uh, on the status, the config status, if either of those are red and you click on them, it'll tell you what's going on. If they're yellow, that means that we're still building, be patient. Uh, the config status is basically the configuration uh, the, the configurations uh, sync is the configuration that you have on Panorama the same as what's up there in the cloud. If you've made some changes locally and you haven't pushed them up yet, that's going to be red. And if you click on the little red button, it'll tell you configs out of sync. Uh, the status here, the top status, is the status of the deployment. So while it's building, it's going to be yellow. If it deployed just fine, everything's green. If it's red, then you go back to the map and see what's red. Now, is it everything or just one MUSPN or what is it? You click on it, click on the little red arrow, and it'll tell you. It'll tell you what's going on. Uh, also, you're able to see the, um, and I'll go back here to show you, uh, the number of users that are currently connected and the number of unique users. Uh, so you may have 100 users connected right now, but you know, you, you're licensed for 5,000 users. Over the last 90 days, uh, we've seen 500 different users. Or maybe you're licensed for 100,000 users. Well, over the last 90 days, we've only seen 1,000 unique users. Maybe you over-licensed yourself. 
uh, or maybe maybe your users aren't connecting to global tech like they're supposed to be. That'll give you some information there. And you can also check connected users by region or by security processing node. There's also great logs, global protect logs, where you're gonna see people connecting and disconnecting and have problems connecting. And user ID logs. Remember, Prism Access, Global Protect, it's its own self-contained user ID stuff. So boom, all your mobile users, they're gonna be they're gonna be seen in a user ID and you can use those and you'll see them in logs, some user ID tab, uh, user ID logs, you'll see them in you know all the threat logs and traffic logs and all that good stuff. And now you can start writing rules for users. Other troubleshooting tools, the ACC. Uh, the ACC now has a global protect activity tab. So you can see successful and unsuccessful connections, uh, overall deployment statistics, uh, user information, uh, failures, uh, their public and private IP addresses that they're using. Uh, you can uh, see statistics about uh, the different operating systems, you know, what percentage are uh, iOS users, what percentage are Macs, what percentage are Windows, etc. cetera. Um, authentication methods, how are these users authenticating? You know, if you have multiple different methods, who's using what method? Well, lots of great information and troubleshooting there. So the Global Protect logs, user ID logs, ACC, that's where you go to, to look at problems. Now we talked about the host inspection profiles. And I said, we kind of discussed how we can use these as an enforcement object in security policy rules and what information we can collect. Well, we have several different families of information we can uh, collect. Uh, mobile device information, you know, hey, is this an Android or, um, or uh, iPhone and what version is it and all that sort of stuff. Um, under general, hey, you know, what Windows version are you running, that sort of thing. It's management. When was the last time you updated your, uh, uh, your Windows device or your, uh, uh, the uh, Android device or whatever. Uh, firewalls, you can require some sort of a device firewall. And any malware, uh, disk backup, disk encryption. Uh, you can have different vendors that you want to um, allow that are acceptable. And for instance, we're creating a rule here for anti-malware. We're saying you gotta have any malware installed and it's gotta be uh, updated in the last seven days. And you have to run a scan in the last day. Or I can do an exclusion and say, no, <laughs> this is not acceptable. We can't use that vendor. Um, or I can have the hip object say, is not installed. So I could say if malware is not installed, I want you to trigger this profile. Or I can say, well, these are the acceptable settings and you'll trigger this profile. These profiles can then get added uh, to your security policy rules under the device. And, you know, we can then create a different um, action based upon matching or not matching these things. So I could say, well, if I created an object that said, 
I want to see if malware is installed and if it is not installed, then I want it to hit a rule that says no antivirus. And then maybe I want to have an action that says block that user or quarantine that user or you know whatever the case may be. So now you can use this as an enforcement device. This is great for non-corporate devices, for personal devices. Uh, mobile users send it home, you know, right? You want to be able to connect with whatever's in your hand at that point in time to answer your emails or uh, get on Zoom or whatever, you know, you may not be sitting in your office, you may be on your laptop, you may be uh, sitting on your iPad watching TV and you need to connect to a Zoom meeting or something like that. Well, you can allow people to use their personal devices, but you can set these rules with these host inspection profiles to say, hey, you know, there are certain requirements you know, we're not going to let an infected device that has no antivirus protection on here. Uh, you even have the ability to uh, set up rules to look at like registry values. So you can say, well, you know, if there's malware, some sort of malware that would contain a registry value of this value, and I know that thing's infected, then you can set that up as a host inspection profile setting. Uh, well, it's not just um, pre-configured stuff. You can check any registry value or um, plist value if it's a Mac device and set rules like that. So this gives you the ability to customize stuff too, not just choose from our options. So hopefully you learned a little bit here about our mobile user solution, uh, the components, portal, the MUSPNs, which think of as gateways, the client software, some best practices and troubleshooting for deployment, uh, and the use of the host inspection profiles in security policy rules. So thank you and for attending. And um, we have a QA function that you can use here on the webinar, if you have any sort of questions, you can feel free to uh, ask those in the QA.